coming now uh, with Bitcoin and at least it's our way to start saving our value and stuff like that. So I'm excited for that at least. All right. Uh, any question? Uh, anyone has questions for Steve Oliver? Yeah. What, what's it like over in Australia right now? I, I keep hearing how like you can't even go in and out without some sort of passport and they're now going to like require vaccines to get in or out or something. What, what the hell is going on, man? So I think the reality is it's kind of like they float various ideas here and there, right? Mm. And I think it's probably similar in America as well. They float certain ideas and say, hey, we might make this mandatory before you're allowed to travel or vaccine or whatever. Um, and so the Qantas CEO, Alan Joyce, so Qantas is, you know, the big Australian airline or one of the biggest. Mm. Um, and they, he came out saying, yeah, we want to make it mandatory for international flights and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but currently right now, it's kind of like there's internal pressure between the different states, right? So mm. what's happening is because most of Australia is like very panicker, they are kind of shouting for more lockdowns or more mask mandates and things like that. So a lot of what's going on is there's this kind of internal dynamic where even if New South Wales, the premier is not so panicker or not as panicker as the others, the other states are kind of putting pressure saying, no, why aren't you locking down or why aren't you doing masks and why aren't you doing this, that and the other to because in their minds they think oh the only reason the virus spreads is because you didn't control hard enough right they don't mm. ask they sort of don't which is so recognize. frustrating it's yeah, so frustrating exactly. yeah and so that's really been a really frustrating thing so i kind of you know i'm just kind of trying to keep my head down and do what i can do what do you know do do uh, live my life how i can but um there, there's yeah look in sydney it's not as locked down right now they are are doing some things like mask rules inside malls and inside hospitality venues and things like that. Um, well, as in you have to wear masks there or they're open with masks or something like that. Yeah. So they've got like restrictions on how many people can be inside a restaurant or a cafe and things like that. There are rules in terms of masks inside uh, like cinemas or the shopping mall. Um, but yeah, for the most part, Sydney's still open. Um, it's just that internal state borders are often closed off to each other. So they're doing, th or they're doing things like if you, you want to go here, you got to do 14 day quarantine and like, and then they'll make you pay for it as well. So if, and all, technically right now, Australians are not allowed to leave Australia unless you get an exemption, you have to apply for an exemption and it has to be like a compassionate exemption. And, it, and when you come back, it's got to be a 14 day quarantine inside the hotel and it'll be like $3,000. Even if you've had COVID and you've already quarantined, they make you do all this. Is, is that the deal? Yeah, I think so. I think they just don't care. They're <laughs> so like, stupid. This, is. this is the thing that I hate about these lockdowns is that even if you've had COVID, you quarantined, you're no longer infectious. You still have to wear a mask. You still have to quarantine you're, you still have travel restrictions everywhere. And, and it's, it doesn't make any sense. If you're if you've already had it, you can't catch it again, and you're not infectious. So why why do you need to obey all these rules? Exactly. In Mexico, we always figure out to get how to get around these rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I was thinking of uh, trying to travel through Mexico, so uh, maybe maybe I should hit you up. Uh, oh, I'd love it. Would love to. We'll take you for a ride out here in the Baja. I'll get you give you a COVID cure. I guarantee it. You might die from it. <laughs> just like covid but it'll be a hell of a lot of fun <laughs> so i think the thing with mexico at least this is my impression i mean you tell me what you see there but i hear it's kind of like there are some rules but it's kind of like the rules aren't really enforced that strongly so you can kind of you know do your own thing right is that true or not yeah that's basically what it is it's, it's, yeah, it's, like, it's, like, it's like that it's like that famous movie clip badges we don't need no stinking badges <laughs> <laughs> It's just, just a way, and then there's the Mexican way, and I call it um, honest corruption, you know, and I, it's kind of like jail, guys, because the same thing, I, when, when I was in prison, I could go eyeball to eyeball, face to face, I was a stand-up guy, and I could prove it with my PSI, and, and uh, so it, I call it honest corruption, and, and you can, yeah, you, there's a way, you know, it's, and, People, you, you earn respect by who you are and what you do. And all this, the FUD that you get, all the, the crap that you get about Mexico is just not true. It, you know, it is, but it isn't. I don't know how else to explain it. It's just, <sighs> Americans have a hard time 
adjusting to the thinking because it's just a different think, a way to think. And, uh, but it is much freer way to, to think and it's very personal. Uh, that you, it's a much more uh, personal society. They're, they're not, uh, look, Mexico can go without electricity and internet and it's gonna do just fine. There'll be no chaos, there'll be no riots. Not so San Diego <laughs> or California or any of the rest of the United States. <laughs> well, that's why culture is important, man. You got to go somewhere where people actually care about freedom. Otherwise, you're free. You don't have any freedoms. Exactly. And they, no, they are someone... very free. Free. They're they're naturally free market people. They just really are. And so, if someone turns the lights off on California for a week, that'd be great. Away from social media, <laughs> like like the like all the social media companies will get blacked out. The people will realize that life can go on and more normal. <laughs> So I have all the things I have to do adjust down here because I don't really need or, or want much, but I want you know I want electricity, I want internet, and, and I want hot water, and they're really not a priority down here. You know, if the electricity goes off, it's no big deal. If you don't have internet, well, you know, it, you have to pay your bill right on time because they don't have any extension for a month. <laughs> you just and so. You know, and I don't speak Spanish well, so I don't pay the bills. And the goat lady forgets to pay the. All of a sudden, I'm doing something. What happened to the electricity? <laughs> why, why, why don't I have internet? You know, why don't I have any? Don't I, why don't I have any hot water? And uh, it's not a big deal down here. Whereas that's a big deal, guys. Try, t- turn off the electricity and uh, not have any hot water for a week, and, and see how you like life. It's it's rough for the average American. So I have a question to pose to like, I guess, maybe Tony, Jimmy, or anyone that's like technical. So you mentioned the lights going out. So um, before, uh, let, I think it was in the fall before coronavirus really kicked off, the Wor- uh, World Economic Forum did a simulation on a coronavirus outbreak. And that was uh, event 201. And a lot of it kind of played out. Um, shocking. Now, the the big thing that the World Economic Forum did this summer was a simulation on what they call the cyber pandemic. So their general thesis is that now that more people are working at home and uh, even, you know, so before that there was a shift to more online and working at home. And now there's been a huge push to it. So there's a lack of security, lack of online security. And that is seeing a rise in hacking attempts and all that kind of stuff all across the world. So now the World Economic Forum is saying that we have the environment with more people online and uh, less secure, uh, people being less secure and now all the solar winds and all that stuff happening. So their World Economic Forum is saying that the next thing will be a cyber pandemic and that's the phrase that people can Google search and they've wrote stuff on it. It's on their website and they think that COVID will seem like a blip compared to this thing and that uh, they will attack, that the attackers will attack um, the power grid basically and that will f- force the power to go up. So how, how does Bitcoin, how does Bitcoin, Bitcoin wallets, our ecosystem, how would we deal with something like that uh, if there actually was, you know, something like that happened? Well, I, I, well, question I have is how many people on this panel have a generator or solar power or an alternate form of electricity? Good well, I mean, we all yeah, do we to do some it. degree because we have those stupid power banks to power our phones. So that that's at the very least something. And well, if you have a solar a panel, that, that'll charge it. I mean, there, the, the thing is like uh, battery technology has gotten significantly better over the past oh, I agree. 10, 15 years. And, um, you know, yeah. I mean, if, yeah. you, if you have one of those packets, your, your phone's good, you know, like that's. No, but what I'm talking about is like a greater, like if the, pa- like, like the World Economic Forum, their simulation is hackers taking out, you know, the power grid, period. You know? Yeah, and and in that so case, what, the what, dollar won't work either because like yeah. uh, uh, I mean, that, that's just let me let me let me. Uh, I want to answer real. There's... I want to answer. I want to answer real quick, and I want to do want to hand it off to Simon Dixon. Uh, thanks for joining us, man. Uh, it's probably very late where you are, or maybe like 10 p.m. ish. So uh, 
So it's all good. Uh, real quick, uh, DJ, so look, I, I don't have, like, I'm too transient. I don't have my own place to live. Um, if I do decide to take a break and I'm building my own house, uh, I would try to uh, account for that and build something. But uh, as far as the economic forum goes, honestly, I think they do plan a lot of shit that seems to ha happen. But I'm also starting to think they're juggling too many balls. You know, between the COVID that they're pushing and uh, all these other agendas, I think they're getting a little greedy with how much control they have over society. And they're on the verge of a global revolution where some of these guys are getting pulled out by their hair out of their houses. That's where I think they're leading into. So I think if they cut off the internet, I think the backlash is coming. I just think they're juggling too many balls now. That's my thought. Uh, Simon, uh, you came in on a very weird note, uh, but uh, hey, glad you're celebrating Bitcoin birthday with us. Go ahead and unmute. Uh, you look like a Bond villain. Uh, and uh, <laughs> how you doing, man? Okay, uh, we can't hear you. You're you're muted or something. All right. So uh, Simon's figuring it out. Uh, so while that's happening, uh, any thoughts on me saying the elites are trying to juggle too many balls in the air? Uh, oh, oh, floor is open. One comment I'd say is that uh, I think people overstate the kind of influence of like World Economic Forum, right? Like I think from what I've heard, like I have friends who kind of work inside governments and things and they, they tell me like World Economic Forum is not necessarily that powerful. It's more like G7 and G it's like those things where they kind of try to collaborate a little bit. But at the same time, countries don't necessarily collaborate so easily because they also have competitive, they're also competitive with each other in some ways. So I think it's kind of like, yeah, obviously there are elements that are out there to try and like, get power for themselves and control other people. But at the same time that like countries are going to all work together to screw you over. Like, like it's kind of, they're often trying to screw each other over or they might not like be that competent themselves, you know? So that's kind of also a, an, an interesting angle there as well. All right, Simon, do we have you back? Yet? Yeah. Is, uh, is my mic working now? Yep. Yeah. You're, you're loud and clear. Oh, cool. Okay. It sounds loud and clear. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, I mean, what a so we're, we're talking cyber attack and conspiracy theories. What are we talking? Uh, no, 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 no. We're, we're, we're talking Bitcoin's birthday and uh, okay. what you like about it. You just happen to join when we're on a weird topic. All right. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, well, is yeah. Been, right? been well, your, 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 your connection is bad or my connection is bad? All right. Okay. Uh, I think it might be Simon's yeah. tone. I think it might be Simon's because uh, yeah. he's coming out choppy to me. Yes. Yeah, okay. Here. Give me a sec. I'll play around a bit. Yeah. Cool. Try, try. You should have a hard wire. Yeah. I mean, it might be. It might be the Isle of Man. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or or the elites are listening and they're cutting us off. Uh, I'll comment yeah. on that weird hey, topic yeah. tone. Yeah, You're start, starting to sound a lot like uh, E.C. Harwood because. He always dismissed the conspiracy theaters, theorists, uh, or conspiracies. So even if it's real, they really don't do a very good job. <laughs> and, you know, juggling too many balls, I think, is a pretty good analogy. So, uh, you know, those are all interesting theories and so forth. But, I, you know, you can't live your, your life uh, according to the latest conspiracy theory. Well, it's not necessarily living in a conspiracy, but I'm just saying if, you know, whether it's the power grid going out or, you know, if there's a CME, you know, or talk about Faraday cages or different things like that, there is the potential like it's we're dealing with a digital currency and online. So how do people that are smarter than me think about the potentials and way that the people that aren't super geniuses can, you know, look after their Bitcoin if, you know, something like that were to happen. Satellite internet, guys. Satellite yeah. internet. You know, that's that's what I have. Uh, why, you know, I can go right on the internet. Are you on satellite now? Probably. Are you on, JP, are you on satellite now? Or, are you, or is that just a backup? No, it's a backup. It's not expensive. I mean, it can get expensive. If you're a right. prepper, it can get very expensive. I, I get it. So yeah, satellite internet is a great backup, but it's, it, it, it'll get you by. But that's about it. Yeah, that's about it. You know, but if you need to transfer, if you need to do something, then that's that's your backup if the power grid wants to go down. 
Hey, Tony, I, I got a question for you uh, on this topic, kind of, sort of, but this whole fat of regulatory um, thing, I don't know if you've been hearing about it, but just curious if you guys had thoughts on that and if you guys are aware of like kind of the OECD, I know um, Stefan recently said or earlier said that the WF maybe isn't that big, but I was at the OECD event last year in Paris and, uh, you know, in a room with 2000 regulators and all that. And, and they're, they're definitely real. Um, and so curious what you guys, uh, what you guys think about that? I, I think we need to wait another six months. Uh, we got to see where they're going with this uh, because uh, I, like I said earlier, Tether, uh, tether uh, Ripple is a bad example uh, to in order to see what the regulator's agenda is, because Tether is a freaking scam. So not Tether, sorry, sorry. I always give Tether and, and Ripple. Yeah, XRP. Yeah, Ripple, tether Ripple, is Ripple, not a Ripple. scam. Oh, tether may or may not be a scam. The jury is out. I don't. I'm leaning towards not, but who the fuck knows? Uh, Ripple was a scam. This is not debatable. It was never debatable. Ripple was a scam from day one. So the regulators going after Ripple is a horrible uh, like assessment of whether the regulators are attacking crypto or they're on the right side of the future. And uh, a lot of us hate the regulators, but there are those rare instances where the regulators actually help the world. They're rare. They're few and far between, but they happen. And the Ripple situation is a terrible judge whether the regulators are bad or they could be somewhat helpful. So we need to wait at other hammers the size of Ripple. Like the next two big uh, smackdowns will tell us how aggressive is the government against Bitcoin because Ripple is a bad example. So I say we wait and see what's going on. Hey, and you know, one thing I've learned is also is, is that uh, regulators tend to be like a multi-headed monster, you know, like uh, there's usually like one head over here, one head, and they have different, you know, objectives and goals and they're all over the place. And and so, yeah, I think the one you're talking about in the United States is definitely pertinent. The one I'm referring to is, is uh, more of a, um, a global like because we're talking about like you know people who control the world or whatever right like oh, I, I find see. it like I, I get the whole trump thing I, I totally agree with you but i'm following all that too i think it's pretty pretty weird um but i'm talking about like who are these unelected officials who are these people that run these these entities mm -hmm. that were created to rebuild the world after world war ii and now they're just there doing a bunch of things because nobody even bothered it maybe uh, figure right. out, you know, what, 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 where they sit. But I, 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 like I said, I've been to these events. I know a lot of these people and I still don't have clear answers in terms of um, how that really works. seems like a bit of a black box for me. And, and, and I find that Bitcoiners what? don't talk about it. Most people, I mean, I know Brian Armstrong tweeted about it or something recently, but it's just like, I, you'd think people would be stressed out about this a bit more than they are. Because you know, what they're saying is they're trying to say, hey, you can't send Bitcoin from, let's say you're even exchange uh, that you just bought it to your own Bitcoin wallet, like on your cold card and whatever, whatever, like that, that, right. Uh, I guess what I'm trying right. to say so, is, so is that, that they that, might be the smarter bad. than we think. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the bad part. So, so while regulators like, uh, CFTC and SEC, while those guys could potentially do some good, mm. uh, the FinCEN doesn't do any good ever to anyone. So there are regulators that are only bad. And the regulators that, are, that enforce money laundering laws, regulators that enforce the banking part of the Patriot Act, uh, regulators that enforce the Bank Secrecy Act, uh, these regulators are some of the worst and most despicable people uh, in the world. Uh, money is property and it should be treated like property. Uh, money is not a criminal act. Uh, the, and they're treating money itself criminally. Uh, the FATCA laws, FBAR laws, these are, this is what's going to destroy America. It's two things. The uh, clown show that is the U.S. election process uh, that's showing the complete distrust of the American rule of law, the economic reaction to COVID, and money laundering law enforcement. This is the three-headed monster 
that's going to destroy the U.S. dollar. And I would love to get Simon's take on that. So that is going to come to a head. Uh, so I'm with you, Sonny, on that part. And the unelected officials that are involved in that process, ignore them with Bitcoin. They, you didn't know who they were and screw them because you have Bitcoin. Bitcoin is literally the last savior. I tweeted this out earlier. There are two saviors to uh, left. One of them is Bitcoin and the other one is Trump. And the reason why the entire world hates, the, like the reason why the elites hate Trump and they control the media to make you the sheep hate Trump is because he stands for your freedom, but you don't see it that way. Uh, Trump and Bitcoin are the only two things left and Trump is done. I'll admit Trump is done. So all you have left is Bitcoin. Hmm. Simon, show's over to you, buddy. Hey, Sonny, I don't know if my internet's still choppy. I'm having you're some You're crystal clear, you're crystal better, clear. Better. All right, cool, yeah, my internet. I'm on some backup now and yeah, I'm having some trouble with internet at the moment. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's uh, yeah, very interesting times. It's an amazing run. Um, I'm not sure, like it's moving a little bit too fast for my liking. Um, but then at the same time, uh, we have an incredible of people coming together. Um, the U.S. Dollar, from from my perspective, um, the U.S. dollar is definitely at the end of a debt cycle. Um, definitely the future they've been empire building for a long time and um, they've been investing significantly in many many different uh, regions many different continents they were first to market with the 5g 5g is the future of artificial intelligence artificial intelligence uh, is you know the future of even these regulatory trends so uh, you know regulate their uh, you know as um as as i run a securities business um, I've always had one step ahead of the future of exchanges. Um, and as an investor in many of the exchanges, um, they've been able to do withdrawals really fast. They've been able to automate withdrawals. But as a securities business, we've always had to do additional checks before every single withdrawal. And so people have always looked at us and said, well, why does it take longer to do withdrawals on your platform than it does on a crypto exchange? And it's because we've got to do all of these additional um, because we're not a, a money service provider and we're a securities business, uh, we've always had to do the anti-money laundering invest for every single withdrawal, which slows everything down. But now all of the crypto exchanges are headed in that direction as well with the implementation of the bank. And so everything is going to change in terms of the speed at which things can be done through these centralized institutions and exchanges. Um, and the automated rules and all that type of stuff and all the, you know, the hack, everything that have been through these exchanges, um, everything's going to get a, a little bit slower and a little bit. Um, these anti-money laundering laws are going insane. And then you've got competing agendas like at the moment, you know, for our European customers, we have to comply with data protection and privacy enhancing laws like GDPR. Uh, then at the same time, you have to comply with anti-money laundering laws. And often what you have to do is in direct conflict um, with the different laws. So you have to be you're willing to break um, because this ginormous friction between you know, protection of privacy and data protection versus money laundering agenda is just ruining money, which I think is driving so much adoption for people to operate outside of these financial institutions. You know, onboard into crypto, onboard in crypto, you're going to have a hard time, but it's keeping people in crypto. And that's why you're seeing things like stable coins getting so much more. Um, people are seeing that this is, this is the only way to actually maintain the, the speed and efficiency because of these anti money laundering laws. Now, when you with central digital currencies, um, you know, they're, they're going to be the, the, the mechanism for integrating all of these artificial intelligence rules for upholding anti-money laundering into code. Um, and so these regulations and things that are being built right now, they're all going to be coded in the next five to 10 years into currencies. Um, so, you know, this is a, 
so to me, the, the big trend that we're seeing right now is America, to me, is starting to look more and more like China every day, and China is starting to look more like America every day. And, you know, you've got fighting for freedom of press and, uh, and um, some of these trends that, that you're starting to see. So uh, a lot of that, things that we've been fighting for the Bitcoin community, the ability to own your own money, the ability to spend your own money without censorship, and the ability actually um, excessive money printing capitalist countries converge more towards socialism and communist countries converge more towards the um, and ginormous big forum um, you know large global organizations like the IMF um, Paris Accords um, you know England against uh, um, to try and in this global capitalist debate that seems to be happening and yet bitcoin just sits in the center of these things in a way i'm just really grateful after 12 years that this whole community has got bitcoin to this point where we are today that it's just an absolute breath share for companies to protect their balance sheet individuals looking to protect some of their sovereignty um, and now i think governments that are actually going to try and get one smaller governments as we end these current and globalist things. Sorry to regurgitate a lot on you, but uh, you know, Bitcoin has really been the only breath of fresh air that uh, and these this, these crazy that we're seeing right now. Yeah, yeah something no, I might just add thoughts, on. Simon, on. And, uh, sorry, if you wanna if you wanna check on that internet one more time, you were breaking up a bit. Uh, so if you, if you can't hardwire into your laptop, that'd be great. All right, Stefan, go for it. Yeah, so I just uh, I think good comments by Simon. I think we have to look at what are the what's the root cause of some of these things and i think fat f is very much a root cause of a lot of these things right because it's like there's kind of this dynamic where fat f is like a global um kind of there's a bunch of countries who all put some like resources into fat f and then fat f in turn drives pressure onto the countries and at each country level each regulator so fincen in the usa austrac in australia etc around the world they then push those requirements down onto banks financial services and now bitcoin companies around the world and so in many cases fatf and sometimes fatf is leading the charge and then in other cases it's more like domestically certain countries are leading the charge in terms of uh, ramping up the financial surveillance and the controls that are required in terms of things like AML and sanctions. Typically, it's AML and sanctions that are mostly uh, that are the most onerous requirements and regulations. So, the way I see it is most of the time, these entities, whether they are the domestic regulator like FinCEN or FATF, they are not considering the impact onto the rest of the economy, whether that's compliance cost, whether that's a chilling effect in terms of people not being able to start a business because you need to have XYZ number of millions of dollars to be able to profitably run a business that can comply with XYZ, all the thousands of regulations out there. And they also don't think about financial inclusion, right? So they, they kind of, they make some vague overtures about these things, but it ends up being that a lot of people just get shut out of the system because they can't afford to be a part of the system or the service providers that would have provided for them can't you know, feasibly operate or profitably operate under this kind of heavy burden of regulation and all these requirements of, oh, you need to KYC this person and ask for a source of funds here and figure out who's the ultimate beneficial owner of there. And it, it, it just becomes this massive, massive compliance burden. But that for us is the importance of Bitcoin and particularly open source software and being able to DIY so that you're not having, you're not so reliant on somebody else running the infrastructure for you that it should be kind of commodity hardware and an easy enough for us to use like our, your own Bitcoin node and your own Bitcoin wallet and all these kinds of things. That's really the importance uh, for us. But then I think I wonder, and I'm curious, you guys might have views on this as well. Are there things that can be done to push back on FATF? Because I think they are very much a root cause for a lot of this. I was kind of where I was getting at too. Yeah, I think it's a good question to ask. I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, but it's a very valid one. Yeah, so I mean, we I'd like to expect my ignorance. And can you please, I, I, you're not coming across right. right, but can you tell me what that is exactly? Fine, that is financial, financial action, action, task, action force. task force. Pardon? Go on, Simon. Uh, yeah, fin financial action task force. It's um, 
the you know the global um com so for example we are a secure we we operate a securities business in the cayman island and it actually has very anti-money laundering laws because um they have the, re the the regulator of the regulator has just audited international standards and therefore they have a big crackdown on all of the things that we have to do now People, you know, we, we're being asked at the moment after having our um, internal audit, um, that we need to make sure we're collecting signatures, authenticating that those signatures are real. Um, and all of this is just the, the, the you know, the financial. Let's face it, look, 9-11 it, took away some of the freedoms um, that led to this ginormous, you know, fear-dread, fear-led um, anti-money laundering agenda. This is actually really about tax collection, let's face it. And um, this is about, let's get as much data as possible because people are global citizens now and we're seeing harder and harder for us to go out and solve. And, you know, that's really what this is all about. Um, and the crime act against is making sure you're paying the tax to the right um, person. Is it um, just me or is it really cutting in and out over there? Yeah. Hey, Simon, okay. you want to try cutting the camera and it might uh, improve your audio. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the man whose hat is older than Bitcoin, uh, Mr. Michael Dupree, uh, go ahead and say a few words. <laughs> hey, everybody. I uh, thought I heard some talk about regulation going on. So I figured I'd come on over here and join in as your it's favorite. one of my favorite topics. Yeah. <laughs> I have a solution to the problem. You're, I'm all ears. All right, Mr. Dupree, uh, give us a little background. You're not on this channel often, and uh, uh, OG-ish, uh, how many birthdays has it been for you? Uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly when I got into Bitcoin anymore. It's hard to remember, but probably around 2011, so it's not been too many birthdays uh, like some of the other guys here, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm Mike. I'm from EasyBit. Uh, we started Denver Bitcoin Center and we do Bitcoin ATM stuff. And uh, yeah, it's really great to see everyone. Happy uh, all time highs. Happy New Year's, all this kind of stuff. All right, cool. Hey, Simon, uh, you want to give it a shot on your audio? See what's going on? Yeah, um, I'm probably going to have to tap out. I think my uh, crappy at the moment and I'm giving you a bad experience. So I'll probably join you on the next one, I think, Tone. I can hear you yeah. now. Now that your uh, video's off, oh, we can cool. hear you fine. Uh, okay. I, I won't go that far, but it's better. Okay. So I yeah, I don't, wanna, I don't want to give everyone a bad experience. Uh, my internet's really choppy at the moment, so I'll get and we'll join. Yeah, so, it's still a little choppy. Hey, we'll do uh, like, hey, next event. Uh, guys, come up with the criteria for another, give me another eight hour live stream, maybe the death of Bcash when it goes below 1% <laughs> of Bitcoin. We'll uh, have to invite James like, Hilliard for that one. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come up we'll come up with another one like i'm willing to do these like once a month we just need like a uh, like a nice you should it's fun definitely all right well uh, 10th anniversary of bitcoin breaking one dollar is like in a month so oh, oh wow we're having one dollar we're having an in-person event here in Miami. If you guys are in town. Oh yeah, there is an event coming up at the end of the month, right? What's yeah. it called again? Uh, it's it's gonna be Bit Basel. If you go to Bit Basel. Wait, didn't that happen already? It is, but it's just like the series, the continuation that okay. we're using to make more. Yeah, because I was saying like Blockchain Week Miami, which I hate that term because there's know, a block. I mean, like prior to COVID, there was a Blockchain Week every week somewhere in the world, uh -huh. and uh, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Looks like the end of January party well, in Miami. Yeah, well, what happened here was that uh, the mayor of Miami, he is so forward thinking. He actually, uh, during the opening of the Bitcoin Center in downtown Miami, he spoke on stage, did a ribbon cutting ceremony for us. Our sponsors were like the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce, Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce, Downtown Development Authority, and the Beacon Council. They were very invested in having this be like a tech hub type of thing. And they did a ribbon cutting ceremony, which was great. And then the third week of January, is now officially Miami Blockchain Week. So they, they used to have like the TNABC conference here, which like Ethereum was launched at and all those like shitcoin projects. Yeah, and stuff don't like get that. me started on that <laughs> I one. But I mean, it's a fun, it's a fun time. So I, I so always had fun at Miami Beach. That was TNAC or whatever you call it. it was never a bad conference, man. Always fun. I know, it, and it sucks because uh, they're not doing it this year. They're they're COVID COVID conscious, as we like to politically correctly say. And I think so, it's too hard to do that one online. 
Yeah. So yeah. I mean, exactly. Well, we might bring unconfiscatable to Miami if we can't get it done in Vegas. If we can't get it done in Vegas, we'll bring it to Miami. And don't worry, because like the GDA will give us some sick hookups, like that boat by my house. We should do that boat by my. Anyways, plans, you guys. But at the end of Miami, the 29th, we're having an event. I'll post in the chat room um, the Miami chat so you guys can keep in touch and see what's happening here. We've got like a couple people here in studio just talking. Yeah, we're going to have more people here coming and then we're going to do dinner. But uh, man, what are the topics? We had some questions actually, but it's uh, if, if you want to go back to the regulation topic, I'm willing yeah, to discuss that some. I love talking about regulation. Uh, I was plugging in my camera when you guys uh, were talking about it. So where did everybody leave off? And then I couldn't hear what. Uh, uh, no, was it's uh, you know, it was like me ranting. I, I'll, I'll just let you say your thing. Like I'm just saying that I, like the SEC bringing Ashing against uh, Ripple is a really, really good thing. And we don't know if it's good for the right reasons or not. Uh, but I but I think, I think that Ripple, if anybody is prepared as best to handle that, I mean, they've been like lobbyist up and ready to go for five years or more. I can't even remember when Ripple started uh, screaming and shouting. Doesn't Ben Lasky work for them or something? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So there you go. They should be safe. <laughs> I know he's hired by him or something. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Bet on this show? Come on. What if it's just a diversion to get everybody's ripple and then they do away with the Swift and take it over? I mean, just a question. <laughs> well, we all never liked Ripple because of the centralization. So I remember always, you know, at the conferences, they always had a big presence and that kind of stuff. But it was never something, you know, I think I bought $100 worth of it years ago just to test it out back when it was through, uh, I want to say, I don't know what that, I can't remember the name of the website, but there was a website where you could do swaps. It wasn't a, uh, so like I would buy through Bitstamp and then swap it into Ripple. I mean, that's so interesting that you said that too, JP, because I feel like if you're in Bitcoin, you're, you're a forward thinker, you're probably pretty intuitive and you kind of like to forecast where the world is going. And I think that what's going to happen with Ripple is that they are going to get in this lawsuit with the SEC. The SEC is going to find them, obviously. Oh, look, they paid us money. Ha, 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 ha. But what they're going to create at that point is case law. by A which standard, yeah. Yeah, but by which crypto, the rest of cryptocurrencies are going to be able to function, and then they're going to implement Ripple as a well. But, but to me, they already created that case law with uh, with the Telegram token when they forced them to do like destroy the Telegram token, and again with Kick. And if the SEC doesn't enforce their prior wins, the SEC has to force Ripple to remove their token from existence. That's the only way. And then they, I think that's what they're going for. If they can already, you know, the exchanges are already delisting that token preemptively. But if they can force- Some are. Some of the exchanges are having trouble with it because there's, uh, you know, contracts that are involved in leverage and stuff where they can't yep. just eliminate the token immediately. Yep. And they're going to get sued by the users for eliminating that Absolutely. token. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it screws up with all the liquidity. So these exchanges need the SEC to force them to remove it because that absolves the exchange from the legal liability of listing it in the first place. But if the SEC can force the removal of XRP from the unregulated exchanges and say XRP is a security, if the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ or uh, BATS exchange wants to list XRP, fine. But you better be a registered security exchange to list XRP. If the SEC can force that, goodbye every single shitty ICO because they can just send them a letter saying this is our action and remove every single ICO token. This is why they're all in trouble. And this is what's interesting. Don't you think the bank has to replace SWIFT with something? They have to. It's um, pretty lucrative for them. I don't know why it's in their interest. The central bank digital currencies. Uh, that's it. I mean, they, they, and then SWIFT is not. Uh, there's nothing wrong with SWIFT. I mean, we're yeah. talking about SWIFT like the uh, ACH payment network kind of thing or the, uh, okay. There's, yeah. nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. They just refuse to update their 1970s database, but there's nothing actually wrong with it. I mean, mm. they'll update the database eventually. It works pretty well, actually. If I send yeah. a, a SWIFT wire, it clears in 30 minutes, usually internationally. It's not like a uh, three day delay or something. They cost $10, but it's not. Like the, the 90% of the problems with the traditional SWIFT is laziness. It's not a technology problem and you don't need a new currency to fix the SWIFT problem. I mean, 
it's, it's also though the, the thing is is that every the people in power who we will never know their real names want more control and what better way to monitor people's transactions than putting it on what they like to call a blockchain so I, I don't know my bet is honestly and i could be wrong but i'm just this is my prediction is that the cbdc is going to be ripple it, it is. It, it, and, and, then, and then you look at the way things happen too. And it's like Ripple had a fork on December 12th. That fork was allowed to happen. And then the SEC went after them. It was like very, 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 very planned opposition. Hmm. I'm still stuck. Yeah, no, I was going to say he, on Michael's point about they're probably the best equipped to deal with this. It's kind of an interesting one because uh, Ripple did a big conference in Toronto called Swell or something like that, where they literally had Ben Bernanke as their like guest speaker. <laughs> and, Bill, and, Bill and Bill Clinton. Ben. Probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was probably. an early one. Snoop Dogg. Hey, it, Snoop like Dogg. Dogg. Hey, to, and Tony, you, you, Ellen DeGenerate girl. Like they the had four her. million thing. Where he like held out the phone and he pressed it. Yeah, she pressed it. Yeah. yeah. All right, new topic. Hey, but, I don't want to talk about Ripple. New topic. Go, go, uh, go. Talk about lightning and feed. Yeah, can we, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, so once again, uh, people are like people are concerned about mining centralization in China. Uh, we keep trying to, you know, like explain that stuff that it's insane. And also like the high fees and lightning. Uh, Jimmy, if uh, it looks like you're reading something, if you want to tackle this first, uh, just reassure people that mining centralization in China is A, probably not happening. And B, if it is happening, it, no one cares. It's not a big deal. It's not Bitcoin centralization. And then we'll talk about fees. All right, so mining, uh, I wrote a whole article about it. Uh, you can go look it up, Jimmy Song, mining centralization scenarios. And there's a ton of, ton of uh, thoughts on that topic. But basically, um, it, it's even less centralized than it was. Uh, like, it, it's more decentralized than it was a few years ago, simply because Bitmain isn't the main producer of ASICs. Um, and that, that production capacity was the main way in which a lot of people thought that it would, uh, you know, cause some harm to the network. But in fact, that hasn't been the case. Um, what's what minor, every mining company will tell you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Micro BT is a uh, is a very strong competitor. Um, they're sold out for the next two years on their mining equipment, and they they are producing better machines than Ant Miner and so on. So, um, from a manufacturing standpoint, you don't have anything to worry about. Um, from uh, you know, like single individual miners, um, there are big players, but there's so many of them now. Uh, a lot of them in China, but there are also many in Canada and the United States. There's a lot of cheap electricity here. Uh, there's some in uh, other places, and you know, uh, even if they are companies that are operating out of China, they don't necessarily have all of their equipment in China. Um, for example, they'll often you know, go to Mongolia and, uh, and use, uh, use the uh, cheap electricity there when it's not rainy season, um, you know, or, you know, if they're, uh, if they're in Canada, you know, they'll, they'll move around Canada and so on. Um, it's not an uncommon thing. Uh, and it depends on wherever the electricity is cheapest. Um, you, you know, there's uh, innovations like using gas flaring electricity for that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, it, it's very, very widespread. Um, this is usually uh, the people that ask are uh, concerned trolling from altcoins uh, because they all like to point this out as like a weakness of Bitcoin. Um, they, they're, they're, I mean, it's just fun. That's all it is. And uh, nobody actually cares about it. So um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be worried. And, uh, and yeah, please stop, uh, you know, like... Uh, concern trolling <laughs> if you are concern troll if it's a legitimate thing then you know um yeah like don't ask uh, ask it in a way that's actually shows that you know what you're talking about instead of oh isn't there a mining centralization you're not even like specifying what kind of mining mining centralization right so hey jimmy have you heard of upstream data no what is that that's the oh my God. Thing. These guys are like it just blew my mind i forget the guy's name right now uh the website's Steve upstream Baba. hmm his name is Steve Barber. B A R. Barber. Yes, 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 yes. So what they do is they take. Um, I'm gonna butcher this, Stephen. If you want to, so if, if you step on, if you want to jump in, do it. But uh, what they do is they take like wasted 
Um, like, you know how when in Alberta, they're digging oil out of the ground, there's like uh, wasted gas that comes out of that process. That, that waste is actually harmful to the environment. And as a result, they have to pay to the government. Um, this guy, this team of people have figured out how to create little miners that they can, they can take that waste uh, material uh, you burn it and essentially uh, mine Bitcoin with it or something. I don't know if they burn it, but they, they mine Bitcoin with it and they turn this waste into, you know, um, usable, I guess, Bitcoin, right? That, that the, the owners of these oil rigs can do. I, I don't know. I'm just curious if anyone's heard of this and if they had any thoughts on it. But I mean, have, no, not so yeah, much. That's a, that's yeah, that's the flaring and stuff. Something I thought, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, I, mean, they're they're I know Marty Bent's working on that. And, mm. and Yeah. Well, so mm. Marty with Great American Mining is a competitor to Steve Barber with Upstream Data. I mean, mm. up they're up in Canada, but um, they're both really exciting businesses in terms of bringing some hash power to America as well. So this is like another angle in terms of the whole, oh, Bitcoin mining centralized, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Um, and I think also when we're talking about Bitcoin mining centralization, we have to also remember that pools and miners are different, right? So mm -hmm. just because the pool operators are in China, the miners can be elsewhere all around the world. And so it's kind of, you know, you got to, we have to remember that. And I think that's one of those things where when you're communicating to somebody who is relatively new to Bitcoin, they may not understand that difference. So you have to kind of teach that point as well. And you, and you also, I think we have to understand that China owns a lot, right? So for example, I used to work in the world of aircraft trading and leasing and the last companies that I worked for, I mean, it was like top five aircraft lessors in the world and about probably 40% of airplanes in the sky right now are on lease. And almost all of them are owned by the Chinese. So while Delta American uh, maybe almost a billion and a half people over there, you got to remember it's a giant, giant, giant market. We've got yeah. airplane centralization, guys. I don't know if the airplane industry is going to work. It's like it's like uh, the the materials that it was that are required in order to make airports have really centralized in China. The gold people that I hang out with, they all tell me that. Uh, there's fear that China has most of the gold. So this is not the only industry where there's just like, oh, China owns everything. But then you go to and world, it, it, wait, wait, you, then you go to worlddebtclock.org and you see that their debt to GDP ratio is 66%. Right. It's like, it's all fucking fake. Look, and the, other, like, and the other thing is, look, it's and a I'm Chinese, so I can say that. <laughs> it's a free market. And if you don't like it, that China, that the Chinese are doing something, do something about it. Nothing, no one is stopping you. You know, like if you have the resources to compete, go and compete. Uh, I think in general, also, they're just really good at some specific things, such as uh, the manufacturing of chips. So you're just going to have uh, not intentionally because uh, there's some centralization. I think you're thinking plot. Taiwan Semiconductor, which is disputed as far as belonging to China or not. In so Shenzhen, that's, they that's don't a manufacture a lot of those uh, chips for miners. No, they're, they're all at TSMC. Well, I mean, they 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 produce the heat sinks and the circuit boards and lots of other things, but not not the actual chips. Yeah, ugly. You're right. Mining for methane. They're, the incentivization to create green energy structures has never happened before. It's the toast you second guess. That's kind of what they did in Iceland, isn't it? They were mining over there using uh, geothermal uh, power, so that's not exactly uh, not green. I don't know about the production of miners in China to run over there, but the Icelandic portion seemed pretty green. Yeah, but you it must be pretty green. Yeah. And I mean it's just it's just how can we repurpose this energy that we're already creating to add value? We put it into Bitcoin and, and there's no otherwise it's like I mean they used to pay millions of dollars to dispose of methane when they mined for oil or when they dug for oil and now they just use it to mine Bitcoin. I thought that they just like burnt it off the top of a, a tube at the top of the oil rig is how the methane went out. I'm not Whatever sure. Whatever it was, it was very expensive and now they use it to mine Bitcoin. Yeah, that's all right, guys. I'm gonna head off. I got a couple things to do, but um, it was great to chat with you all, and uh, we'll see. I'll see you guys next time. Hey, bye. Nice see you. Joining, man. Thanks yeah, for thanks, thanks for, for stopping by. Yeah. Hey guys. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that Marty and the guys at uh, Great American Mining are working on is just like trying to trying to you know cross the the culture gap between the oil and the natural gas industry and Bitcoin. <laughs> so you've got these old you know in your mind you think of them as like these old miners. And then they're sitting there trying to learn, trying to understand Bitcoin. But what they do understand, and this is somebody who works with them, was on, I think it was Marty Ben's podcast a couple of weeks ago, and basically said the, the amount that they can make, if they, if they just stop selling their, their gas and oil to the existing suppliers or like the, their existing customers and started mining Bitcoin with it, was anywhere between 4x 
And in 2008 and 2017, at the height of Bitcoin's, you know, last all time high, they said it got as high as 12x. Wow. So I, I just feel like as soon as like when these when these oil and natural gas producers realize the amount of money that they're leaving on the table, you know, like it's just going to create. And then again, you can bring back fracking because all of a sudden fracking is monetarily, you know, it, the business model works, you know. And so that's been part of the re, part of the problem is that the business model doesn't work right now with oil and gas at the prices they are. As soon as you can get those, you know, get to the point where these companies are making tons of money, all of a sudden you're going to be able to make even more money. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Now, um, I, we have some requests in the chat for Michael for you to uh, talk about some more regulator stuff. So I, I mean, only no, Tom said, no, never mind. We want to stay away from the SEC enforcement dis division is like a couple blocks this way. So we're going to be good little players right now. But uh, I, this is actually a question that I have for you guys and you guys are, are highly intelligent beings. So this is about the second of Bitcoin. So for the internet to exist today, there's seven different layers to the internet. A lot of people don't know that, but they use it widely. And now with Bitcoin, our second layer being built on top is lightning, especially right now with all of the transactions that are happening with a mempool being full. It's like fees are super, super high. So what is going to happen to combat that? Like, I mean, lightning, obviously, but I guess is that, yeah, question. Oh, I don't floor. know. <laughs> do you think that the uh, was that a question towards me i wish i could pay my fees in fiat you know like my little 20 dollar bitcoin transaction fees i wish i could pay them in fiat and i don't understand it. why there's such large fees even to start with i mean this is a big problem with bitcoin atms because we'll have someone that comes and buys 20 dollars worth of bitcoin and we're not able to accurately predict if it's going to cost us as the operator uh, $1 to send that transaction or sometimes $25 to send the transaction, which is in fact more than the actual transacted amount. So it's a, it's a, it's a mess. But I think that a lot of the Lightning Channel stuff's really cool. It's really interesting. As nerds, it's, it's fun to talk about and fun to play around with. But uh, it, I think it's really hard to force everyone out there to do these side chain solutions versus just fixing whatever the problem is. Why are people able to charge so much for transactions? All right, tech people chime in because I've- and, and From what I heard, apparently it is so challenging to do a fee proper fee aggregator. And I don't understand why it's freaking challenging because all I have to do is open satoshi.space and within three seconds, my brain can tell what a proper fee should be. And I don't understand why it's so challenging for a computer. And this brings us to another question. When people are afraid of quantum computers, and I'm like, you know what? We can't even estimate a goddamn fee for Bitcoin. So the last thing you should worry about is a quantum computer. You know, insane, just insane. We, we have multiple I, it, scripts running that check different prices and stuff every 30 seconds to decide what we're going to send the next fee for a transaction that the Bitcoin ATM network is, because we literally just cannot accurately predict it in a logistical, reasonable way or rational way. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 you're good. Like, people really underestimate the ability to, to like, process, uh, like, computer information. Like, like, I travel for a living. And I'm my own travel agent and I find my own tickets and I and give me 30 minutes and I will do, and if I have like a complicated route, give me 30 minutes and I will do a better job, uh, cheaper, faster, more efficient than any third party travel agent site like Expedia or Kayak. I can do a better job myself without those sites. So no, they're, they're not. They're just not motivated to actually get something done. Uh, I mean, like if you're doing it for yourself, of course you're going to do it better. And also you probably have more experience booking flights than most of the guys working at kayak these days. Right. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not efficient at all. And this goes back to like my last job before I, I got into Bitcoin uh, was at a company that did risk analysis. And the CEO of that company was, uh, uh, was a big, uh, I mean, he revolutionized like, like traffic routes. Uh, like for example, when a UPS truck has to deliver packages to Is like this the left hand turn thing, uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, like, like, like optimizing your route. Like if you got to pick up four friends to go to a party, you got to like optimize what's the most optimal route to pick up who and how to drop them off. This is like a numbers problem, I think. This is actually, it's like the traveling salesman dilemma exactly. or something traveling, like that. Exactly, the travel salesman dilemma. And once you get to like more than eight stops, 
it becomes exponentially. It's an, harder. It's an NP complete problem, is right. what they call it. And, yeah. And I can't believe people think that quantum computers are going to destroy Bitcoin. Like we're probably like 50 to 100 years away from uh, them being actually dangerous to Bitcoin. It's still possible someday. I'm not going to say it's impossible. I mean, we've learned with Bitcoin, you never know how quickly things could move. But uh, I certainly don't see it uh, changing that quickly. I, yeah. Not to mention, won't Bitcoin just adopt a little bit to change the mining algorithm so that it's quantum computing resistant if 51 Yeah, I mean, the, the quantum question is probably the most annoying question ever because it's entirely based on hype from the mainstream media. Like nobody actually knows anything about quantum computing. Like I, uh, when I talk to Giacomo, I, he, he gets what I'm saying. It's about like the phases and like what, what you can observe and what you have to actually have to do. And then like calculating the difference and then doing that multiple times to see whether you can get the phase and then you can, you can break this particular algorithm and so on. But it, it's, it's not easy. And people seem to think, oh, it'll progress just like microchips or something. It's yeah, like you're, you're going to buy a new CPU and all it's of a sudden you can crack like Bitcoin. That. <laughs> no, it's, it's nothing like that. It's, it's very much like you, you, you have to like cool these atoms down to like a fraction of a degree above absolute zero and keep them there in this like weird quantum state. And then like observe things. And then you might have like, quantum decay or in all kinds of things that you have to correct for it, I mean, like people make it sound like, oh, you know, we just have to put 30 more people on it. And then, you know, it'll be completed in like five more years. That's not how it is at all. This is like, this, this is stuff that is just so difficult that if innovation comes at all, it would be done. It, like it, it would take a, uh, it, it would be, it would take pretty much everyone by surprise. And you need like four or five of those you, types of you wouldn't in order analogize to get it anywhere close. So like, it, it, would you it, 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 would yeah, you I, analogize it to on. when A6 came out though? To like when we were, you know, the no, no, it's nothing like A6. A6 from were GPU no. like, to A6. We knew the actual process of how to make an A6. It, it wasn't that was inevitable. This is something that is just so completely beyond what we know how to do. It's and too it's, theory. It's, it's difficult on a theoretical level. It's difficult on, uh, on an engineering level. It's difficult on a production level. It's difficult all across. And you have none of the infrastructure that's built for conventional computers anywhere near, uh, uh, yeah, anywhere near what, what you have for conventional computers. You have silicon manufacturing. You have oh. all sorts of circuits and transistors and all, all sorts of stuff that's already built. You don't have anything like that for quantum equivalents of any of this stuff. You have to have like, it, it, it just boggles my mind why people think they're being smart when they say, oh, but what about compu quantum computing? Okay, yeah. then explain to me exactly what quantum computing is. And then they, they, they uh, give some like, uh, you know, something that maybe they read in a, uh, in a science fiction book four years ago and think I that they're being want all smart, which uh, the science fiction writer probably doesn't understand either. So it's like, it, yeah. it, it's like third or fourth hand or fifth hand information that they have no idea I, what the hell they're talking about. I think about. there's far Try more pressing be, urgent issues that could uh, yeah, I, I make mean, problems than these quantum are, computing. These are things that this is what midwits think is being smart, is throwing up objections that sound interesting, but to anyone that it's actually versed in the actual Stuff, we actually have they real know problems that they, to fix. These, these, are, these are the real idiots that ask questions like that because they don't understand anything at all. Yeah, and this anyway, is why I just needed to get that off my chest because you really <laughs> feel. I, 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 it's, it's been bugging me for so long because it's just something that people shout from the rooftops. Like so good. That was that good. That was good. I like that. What <laughs> would, if we have to come up with a definition, what is Sonoid and what would Bitcoin Sonoid look like? If we're our own banks, Sonoid was the right of the king, and they actually supplied this money supply. It served. Well, I mean, that's I, I think the closest had analogy is uh, not have fees, the face though. value of the of whatever it is. And so, you know, is Sonoid a valid economic principle, monetary principle? I think it is. It was a service that governments actually provided and they didn't tax anybody it actually it was the way that the the king could you know uh tax the nobles sort of say but he was providing a service for it 
and I don't have the answer to this, but I'm just saying, I think there, this, this isn't in a new problem. It's Sonorage. And I think we need to look into what, what, what would Bitcoin Sonorage look like? And, and plus too- And the market saw I, I think it's already it's, there, no? Um, I mean, it's, it's basically just minor fees, no? And let's say that like also with IBM Watson, right? This, that's this huge supercomputer that people always reference. By the time that even it even gets to the computing power to be able to do something to the Bitcoin blockchain, that will be years from now. And it's not like the Bitcoin blockchain is going to stay the same in terms of its hash power. It's going to also grow. So it's it's not like a one thing grows and and then everything else remains the same. Another point is this: that like I mean, again, you have you have innocent people, right, who like hear these things and who genuinely are confused and concerned about innocent them. people. So, yeah, <laughs> you have people who like who just don't understand. They just heard this thing and so they're afraid, whatever. And so one of the things that I do is I just follow them, just keep going down the road with them. So it's like, okay, so who's going to be able to come up with you know a quantum computer, a nation state? So as soon as some nation state has this, you know, again, they come up with this thing and they attack again. Bitcoin is going to be lower down the totem pole than a lot of other things like power grids and all these other things. So like, let's say they do that, they attack the power grid. Well, then they just, and they steal from literally every like nation on earth. Like they've just set themselves up as, <laughs> they've set themselves up, as, selves up as a target that, to be taken out by all these other people. So it just like the game theory doesn't even work out. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> all right, hey guys, can I just read a comment that like, maybe it's because I've been streaming this for the last, what, 10 hours now or something. Uh, I mean, it's just like, I read it twice and I'm like, I, I'm, I'm a little too slow. Maybe somebody else would, would understand. I just also throw in there, you know, Talk to me about quantum computers where half my computer problems aren't solved by restarting the device. Uh, okay. Uh, so <laughs> ASIC, ASIC solves those already, right? <laughs> Here's the comment. Uh, I, don't, I don't even think it's uh, related to quantum computers, but it's just a general comment. I think it's smarter than me. Uh, if the energy value of the bits used to store the smallest money unit is above the notional value of that money unit, then there is an arbitrage. Get the money, take it out as energy, and sell the energy. Uh, if someone, I can read it again, uh, but like, can someone explain I that mean, to how me? How would you I don't convert follow. it to energy? I mean, like, if if uh, if storing it, uh, you know. I'll read it like, again. I'll read it one more time. Um, if the energy value of the bits used to store the smallest money unit is above the notional value of that money unit, then there is an arbitrage. Get the money, take it out, and sell the energy. Well, that, but it, it it assumes that it's reversible, that you can turn the turn the thing back into energy. The money back you, into energy, which you can't. Okay, got it. Now, yeah, now it yeah, makes I mean, sense. it's it's kind of a nonsensical question unless it's reversible. So that's correct. You can't you can't convert your Bitcoin back into energy. It doesn't work. Well, out. you can use your Bitcoin to buy energy in an open market, perhaps. And for example, but, solar panels do that. If you have a solar panel without the diode to prevent the batteries from going backwards, the solar panels will radiate heat as the electricity goes through the solar panels. But you're right, it doesn't really work with Bitcoin unless you're going to run an ASICs backward or something like that. Yeah, but that wouldn't that wouldn't work either. No. <laughs> so, I mean, you you yeah. look you, you, you you'd have to reverse the flow of thermodynamics in order to make right. that. You work. can also burn your Bitcoin into something stupid like counterparty, but uh, up to you. <laughs> Colored hey, I wanted to say hi to fellow Bitcoin ATM guy, um, Mike Dupree. <laughs> hey, uh, sorry, I went for a bathroom break really quickly. My apologies. Hey, <laughs> okay. haven't seen you in a while. How you doing? Good, good. So Welcome. Mike, how... Forums and stuff sometimes. So, Doug, how do you figure out your minor fees? I don't mind. I the best no, no, no. In, a, ATM, in, in, your in, in your ATMs. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, we You're let the market decide. Yeah, the market decides. So we have our deployers are the ones who set the fees unless we deploy the machines, which we kind of do in my, Miami area a little bit. We've got three of them down there. I know, I want you to go look at it. But our, we, we, you know, the, our deployers look at the going rate amongst competitors and then they set those fees. That's typically how it goes. We're not, we're not talking about the transaction fees. We're talking about the mining fees. 
Oh, so one of uh, you, you jumped in a little late to the conversation before we were talking about uh, some issues, uh, some solutions such as Lightning Network and uh, SegWit, these other uh, different tools where you can avoid, for example, as an ATM operator, I was given an example earlier that uh, somebody would buy 20 uh, US dollars for my machine or 20 euro, whatever you want to call it, and they would uh, end up. I would pay $25 or 25 euro in the uh, transaction fee amount. And it just didn't work. That's what we were talking about. Not the yeah, percentage okay. of. Uh... Yeah, we use the, um, you know, the automatic fee calculator just from the Bitcoin core. Um, and then we also charge it back to the uh, customer, um, which is not perfect. We use SegWit addresses. So that, alleviates the fee a little bit uh, and helps the network grow. And you everything. guys support lightning at the moment or no? We don't yet. Um, oh, but it's either, gotta, yeah. yeah, it's got, it's got to happen, you know, in one way I was just trying to, Hey, I just, I just signed up for BitBlock boom, by the way. And I saw that I could pay with lightning. I was hoping to use strike, you know, where it pulls money from my account straight into Bitcoin, passes it on to Gary Leland. That would have been kind of cool, but it, it, he was I, on, he was on earlier. Hey guys, I, I want to, I want to get a couple of guys in here. A couple of brothers uh, are. Uh, we have the Arnold brothers uh, from uh, the Old Coin Daily Show. Hey guys, Love thanks for joining. Tone, thank you so much for having us on, man. We're a huge fan of your show. Long Bitcoin, can't wait for these altcoins to die. We we talk about the whole market though. Uh, great to be here, man. <laughs> it's amazing. The Old Coin Daily Show, can't wait for the altcoins to die. It's uh, that's so like like Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Love well, it. I've seen every single episode uh, crypto scam. I mean, still, you know, I'm excited about the trends in the cryptocurrency space, but uh, you know, given enough time, I'm gonna trend towards zero yeah, versus Bitcoin. I haven't heard my announcement uh, earlier. So I think January uh, will be the last month that I you talk about, uh, that I shit on shit coins. Um, I, I think I'm retiring from talking shit about shit coins. It started for me. Uh, I always try to like, you know, create new trends. I've been slacking for a year on creating the Understanding Bitcoin uh, series, where just like, you know, in 2015, 16, or 16, I think I started the uh, crypto scam series, which I didn't f continue following. Uh, but now it's time to do the opposite. It's time to start the Understanding Bitcoin series. And I'm going to start just ignoring the shit coins completely. And I think uh, my life would be a lot better and more enjoyable. Uh, so that's the direction that I am headed. Uh, but I, I think I've educated the world enough on staying away from shit coins. Uh, but my question for you guys is how many Bitcoin birthdays is it for you? I have one reply for your shit coin story. And that is people always ask me, what do you think about all these altcoins? And what do you think about like the United States government creating a cryptocurrency of its own? And uh, my uh, reply to that is always, well, if you want to talk about shit coins, there would be no worse shit coin than taking a Federal Reserve and a government and a state and creating crypto out of that. A blockchain is absolutely not needed. We don't need those people involved in this. That would be the ultimate shit coin. But I'm with Tone on most of these uh, most of these new coins, unless you got a real purpose or uh, you got some real cool concepts behind you. I'm really not interested in hearing a bunch of theories anymore. We've we, we all went through that for what, eight years now or something? Like, we, we've heard enough. Hey, every altcoin that gets sued by the SEC will cause a Bitcoin pump. Uh, but I totally feel you, Tone. Sometimes it's better just to be neutral and talk about Bitcoin. Yep, yeah, that, that's my plan to do it. Uh, hey, guys, go ahead. Floor is yours. Talk about Bitcoin birthday a little bit. You guys aren't new to running a, uh, running a podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron and I first heard about Bitcoin in 2013. Goddamn wish we would have got involved. Didn't really pay attention. Uh, got back. Uh, it got back on a radar very late 2016, and in that 2017 run up, we got more and more interested. Started our channel in 2018 when everybody was leaving cryptocurrency. People were getting less interested. It was after the bubble, and slowly cultivated a channel out, building a like minded community so excited to be a part of number 12 i guess it's only been a handful yeah totally um this is our first bull market as as content creators and, and we're like market commentators for those who don't know um totally just you know average people in the space commenting on the market um but to this i heard you asking people earlier you know what is your price prediction for the uh end of the year so i guess i'll just say mine and maybe austin has something different and uh you know i like to explore what the experts actually have to say and, and talk about that. But I guess if Bitcoin did 300% this past year for going into a more mature phase of the bull market, we're at least going to do 300%, I would assume. And that's at least 
$115,000. So that's my end of the year conservative price prediction. Yeah, for me personally, I'm not selling till we get at least to 2 million. So it does not matter. Uh, I'll see you guys at 2 mil. Jimmy, you remember uh, when we interviewed you and met at Bitcoin is? I do. I do. It was it was fun. And, uh, you know, that that's where I made connections with uh, Russell Kong and, uh, you know, George McHale. And, you know, a lot of those guys uh, ended up helping with the book. So, yeah, it, it's uh, it's a you know, the book kind of came out of that conference a little bit. That's why I give to that. I used to give uh, the Bitcoin standard, but, you know, people have to, like, understand what that is. I always give the little Bitcoin book. I gave a couple. Of oh, oh, this is I'm talking about Thank God for Bitcoin, which is the latest book that I have. Oh, what? I didn't even know. OK. Uh, OK. Well, I mean, uh, Jordan was on earlier. He's uh, he's one of my co-authors and Julia was on earlier. She's one of my co-authors. Uh, but yeah, let me know if you want to talk about that. Okay, cool, enough. cool. Because I love the little Bitcoin book. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a little bit different. It's a, it's a, got a more moral and spiritual element. So yeah, there you go. I have a question for the Arnold brothers. Are you guys still acting? Yeah, we're uh, full time actors, full time uh, crypto YouTubers. We're in the union. Uh, we're actually uh, in pre production and. Uh, just got cast as guest stars on this Fox show. Uh, that's what we're going to be filming in January, but we do both full time. We, we like to work. Cool. Last... So speak... Where are you guys at? LA. LA, LA baby. Oh, speaking of um of books, Jimmy, I don't. I try to reach out to you guys because I have. I wrote a, a, a screenplay and a book, and I think I might just self produce it because I'm so pissed off that the Hollywood system takes so long. I wanted to see if you guys wanted to take the starring roles. Um, it's a, it could be a, it could be a brother team. I don't know if Tone read my book. Tone, if you've got it, could you hold it up? It's called The Apology. I'm in Miami. Uh, he's not, he's not home. Oh, yeah. that's right, that's right. But I'm I'm kind of semi serious. I've got some commitments from uh, some, some other actors in the Bitcoin space too. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can, can we back this up? Why are you asking me to hold up your book? Shouldn't you be able to hold up your book? <laughs> and why are all the OGs in the Bitcoin space actors? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm not an actor, dude. <laughs> I'm, not I'm not an, an OG. OG. I'm in my girlfriend's house. I don't know where it is. What's, what's the elevator pitch? What's the movie about? You got to give us the one line. Okay. Are you ready for this? Okay, a guy does something stupid with his girlfriend. She breaks up with him. And she was right. He writes the apology letter from his heart and gives it to her. She comes back. His buddy or brother says, dude, can I borrow that letter from my girlfriend? Oh no, it'll never work. This was a personal letter only for her. It worked because we're a couple. No, no, it'll work for me. I'll just change the name, a couple of nicknames and a couple of memories and it'll work for me too. Bada bing, bada boom, it works for him too. They make a business by allowing other guys <laughs> to buy this letter online anonymously using Bitcoin. And it steamrolls from there. There's a hacker incident. They bring in more letters. They become an international sensation that everyone's trying to find. And at the end, they get discovered. And there's a big giant scene at the end with everyone cry because it's so beautiful. It's a, it's a romantic comedy. Sounds great. Along the veins of Silicon Valley and um, modern romance. Meets Justin mm. Sun. And what role do you have for Tone? Is he going to be the guy that uh, that Villain. initially breaks I up, think, or what? Uh, Tone could be the guy. If you, the letter is is copied. Well, the, yeah, the, you would you would think it would be very easy to like just go, like yeah. torrent or something, you know? Well, like, what I did or post yeah. on Reddit. So in stories, you have to do a little disbelief. So in in my uh -huh. story, the letter is gets deleted after it's delivered. And uh -huh. you have to pretend like you can't copy it. So there's a little bit okay. of a suspension of disbelief there. But yeah. Okay. Make, so, making the letter a scarce resource instead of an infinitely copyable one, which most digital things are. NFT. Yeah. Exactly. Just kidding. Yeah. That sounds pr pretty cool. Did, have you emailed us? That sounds interesting. I, I, I think I have. But would you guys in the chat just throw me an email? I will get right to you. I'll send you the... <laughs> I'll send you a book. Can everybody just please put their emails in the chat? <laughs> you got funding yet? Self-funding, and I, I have I have Hollywood connections. My brother, my my business partner, is a screenwriter. He wrote Disney screenplays. He's had a he he doesn't work really hard, so but I he has never really pushed it around too much. But um, I think we could self-fund something like this and pitch it. I've got lots of connections. You know, Tone knows I was part of Watch My Bit. That helped us get a lot of 
some Hollywood connections and, you know, there's Netflix connections we have too, but, you know, and you guys have connections. Brad's a movie guy. Brad, (laughs) aren't you a movie guy? Uh, I I made a movie. Yeah, I made a cheesy 80s horror movie. I self-funded it. I raised uh, $100,000 in 2000 and what was it? Nine, eight, something like that. That's what, like three Bitcoin? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was that was like before I was I dabble in all kinds of different things but yeah I'm gonna go find my book really quick in my girlfriend's house that's why I know I don't have it he, uh, he... go for it Doug while you're doing that I want to get Hugo uh in the conversation here uh Hugo uh are you still uh big in the uh I guess the Brazilian markets the Latin American markets Venezuela uh give us a little update on what's going on and uh it's, it's a few birthdays for you now of Bitcoin yeah just hey, uh flo- floor is yours go ahead and unmute, mute buddy uh, hey guys, I don't know if you can hear me. Yep, yep. You're good to go. Loud and clear. Uh, okay, first of all, thank you, Tom, for inviting me. It's the first time I joined your stream. Uh, so it's uh, it's very nice to see you all here on the uh, Bitcoin birthday. So uh, happy birthday to all. So, uh, <laughs> so what was your question again? Sorry? Uh, just give us an update on Latin American markets. Can I, can I ask you a specific question, actually? Yeah, go ahead. So I have uh, some employees in Venezuela who told me that they are no longer able to accept Bitcoin because the government there is cracking down on them accepting Bitcoin. And uh, I had to send her payment a different way. Is, is something different happening there? Uh, first of all, I, I am Portuguese, so I am in Portugal. Uh, we speak the same language, but I am not in South America. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, the Spanish is a little different language. But uh, I have Venezuelan employees in Venezuela who are still accepting Bitcoin. They love it. Interesting. Uh, so from what I hear, uh, Argentina, for example, uh, interest in Bitcoin is uh, 100% in Google Trends. So I guess it's really growing in, in, in South America. They had a lot of problems in Argentina over the years with the uh, with the currency inflation. I think in the last uh, five years, we've seen consistent uh, hyperinflation. I had an office in Argentina for the last five years, and that's kind of uh, what what I saw is it almost wasn't even worth going down there anymore because everything was so expensive. Yeah, I mean, inflation in Argentina is spiking like crazy. So I guess a lot of people are buying Bitcoin there. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, in third world countries, they definitely need it more. And this is what I tell people too, when they're like, oh, Bitcoin, meh. I'm like, you know, you come from a very privileged perspective living in the United States and it's effective in third world countries. And I don't just- know. If you look at the US dollar, it's not doing so well against Bitcoin, gold, silver, you. euros, pounds or anything you know, else. So. They're comfortable and they're freaking brats and they're spoiled and they live in their parents' basements. They never had to work a day in their life. And so, or they're like wealth managers and they don't understand what it's like to not be able to access a bank account so i just love that just that one liner where it says i found it crazy when i was working with these venezuelans that half of them somehow had an american bank account and a paypal account that that you could send money to and i was like wait a second it's hard for me to get a bank account i'm american what like uh, how does everybody in venezuela that works for me uh have bank accounts (laughs) i gotta make it work (laughs) So how's everything in Portugal? All, all is good in Portugal because uh, we are still still one of the eight countries in the world that uh, don't have to pay taxes on Bitcoin gains. So it's mm-hmm. really cool to be here. It's really cool. Mm-hmm. Does that apply? That, that, that's not, that, that just applies to Portuguese residents, right? You don't even have to be a citizen as long as you're a Portuguese resident. If you are a Portuguese resident and you have a bank account here, you don't have to pay any gains on Bitcoin. So is all so all you have to you can be a a, a citizen of any or a, uh, like uh, probably a, any yeah, European country. resident I don't of think any it could or, be American. Well, then you still owe American taxes, but uh, yeah. so uh, but okay, got it. Wow, that's pretty cool. Hey, uh, I've been dying to go to Portugal, man. I, I, I like my the, the the two most frustrating things about 2020 for me is that I didn't get to go to Japan and I didn't get to go to Portugal. Like those are my two countries. I don't miss Japan, man. I've spent uh, many times in Japan. I had enough time there. Uh, However, Portugal, I love it, especially their islands. They have absolutely amazing islands over in Portugal. (laughs) And the food. 
And for those who don't know, I live currently in Barcelona, Spain, which is uh, not even a far train ride from Portugal. So we're not too- no, Just a few much. hours. Beautiful place. Uh, it's okay. actually official. So I have, I have the official PDF released by the government saying that Bitcoin is not considered money in Portugal. So that's the reason why they uh, officially. They that's did the this reason in Estonia too. Charge, officially, that's the reason why they don't charge any taxes on Bitcoin gains. But off the record, everyone in Portugal knows that the main reason why they did that is because they want to attract people doing business in Bitcoin and so contributing to develop the Portuguese economy. I think right. one of the other people that did this was Estonia a few years back had said that with their e-residency program and such that you could easily incorporate a company there and that they wouldn't tax you on uh, gains from Bitcoin because they didn't consider it property at the time. But uh, that gets really confusing because we go back to this horrible regulation topic that uh, Tone doesn't want to talk about. But I mean, in America, uh, I've been told by like multiple agencies that it is property. It's not property. It is currency. It's not currency. It, it's a, you cannot sell it as a security, but we're going to find people for selling it as a security. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just in a state of confusion, I guess. Look, is your ATM network now, Mike? Uh, we're in 18 or 19 countries, but uh, we're a lot smaller than we used to be. So, I mean, back in the earlier days, uh, we owned like maybe 50 or 75 percent of all the ATMs in the world. And uh, these days, I, I didn't check recently, but uh, last time I checked, there was like 15,000 wow. Bitcoin ATMs in the world. Let me ask you one thing about it. Sure. How much percentage of the Bitcoin ATM traffic is done anonymously with no KYC versus having to do the, uh, the a AML. KYC it's a really, checks. it's a really tricky question because it depends upon the country and the laws. So for example, I don't want to get into specific operating partners or specific countries, but I will say there's some countries that we operate in where if it's under 3000 Euro, they don't require any sort of KYC whatsoever. However, if you're talking about the United States, uh, market, which is our primary market, uh, there you're talking about, uh, we do KYC from dollar one. So, I mean, there is there is any no... way to do it? Like, is there any threshold where you don't have to do KYC in a Western country? You know, this is not, I'm not a lawyer. This is not a specific question. It's a, it's about how you interpret the regulations and such. And what you come up with is an entire compliance plan for your company where you have to figure out like, what are we comfortable doing and not doing? So it's not about what exact law says this or what exact law says that, but what do we know we're going to be able to do safely without violating some crazy federal anti-money laundering uh, criminal. I, I don't even know what they, you know, they probably continue a terrorist if you're a money launderer in the United States. So we play very much on the side of caution. And as such, we take uh, KYC from dollar number one. If you're going to buy more than a couple hundred bucks, uh, I don't know the exact thresholds on the machines off the top of my head. But essentially, if you're buying more than a few hundred bucks, you're going to have to put in more info. If you're buying more than three grand, you, we're taking your social, we're uh, all sorts of things. So it's not anonymous at all, I would say. No, yeah, hey, Brett, I mean, last, um, time, last time I was, the, I don't remember, Canada a few years ago, you didn't take any KYC on your ATMs for a thousand or several thousand worth of mm -hmm. Canadian dollars. I know they're, they're, the Don't exchange rates the going to shit, but uh, Canada was pretty lax on ATMs. We have, we have ATMs in Canada as well. Yeah, we do too. We, uh, we're a manufacturer of ATMs uh, out of Ukraine and uh, we, we have 3,668, I think the last time I checked out there in the market that we wiped label we own our own software count higher than i <laughs> so how does the average person that just wants to put 400 500 bucks of bitcoin into an in a, in, a, in a way that's private and anonymous like is there a way to do that easily without having to like private and anonymous it really depends upon the jurisdiction so i mean like we've got machines from united states to places like ukraine and place or sorry not ukraine he so just mentioned ukraine yeah. to slovenia and uh, places where you can put in um let me let me rephrase the question let me rephrase the question yeah so if an american wanted to buy bitcoin anonymously through an atm what's i the couldn't help them what, what, what's the closest place he can fly to 
I think he could find operators in the United States that would do it without KYC. However, when you look at like an operation where we're operating in multiple countries and multiple states and we've been around a while, uh, it's not worth it for us to take that risk. Now, if you've got a guy where he bought one Bitcoin ATM and he's a college student and he's operating it uh, at the bar that's next to his university and, uh, you know, is that uh, is FinCEN really going to go after him? I don't know. In wait, my wait, case, wait, we're, we're really cautious about it. So I think you could no, find someone in America. I don't think you heard my question. I said, if an American wanted to buy Bitcoin anonymously through an ATM, what country should he fly to? Like something reasonable, like Japan is a little too far. Croatia. However, I think in the United States, you will find ATMs that do not take KYC or what? AML at all. To certain you will. Aren't there some in but, Canada? But if there's I, no I KYC, to... what are the limits? I mean, if there's no KYC, I put in 1,000, then I start the next transaction and put in 1,000. So, I mean, if there's no KYC, then there are no limits. Sorry, Jimmy, didn't mean to cut you off. You know, if you guys I, aren't there ones in Canada, I mean, I, I imagine I have ones. ATMs in Canada. There we yeah. require just a scan of your Canadian driver's license and you can do up to like 10,000 or something on uh, one transaction. If you want more than that. And again, I don't know all these details off the top of my head, but right. if you're asking the question, where what country should you go to to buy Bitcoin anonymously? I would say uh, Vietnam's high on that list. Our ATMs in Vietnam, the Vietnamese government does not. How about prepare. Mexico? Some, somewhere well, closer we, to the U.S., I think. Didn't is have what any like. in Mexico. Bermuda, um, you know, I don't know, like no, uh, Jamaica, have, somewhere, somewhere like we that. We have ATMs in Panama, uh, uh -huh. in Ecuador. And but do they not require KYC? I have also in Ecuador. Yeah, um, they, the KYC that's done is through an SMS text message. Yeah. Uh, and, and then if it's over a certain amount, depending on who owns that ATM, again, just like you said, Michael, when we're the manufacturers and we're putting these ATMs out, we have to cover our compliance. We have to be a kind of self-compliance on our own. Um, we can't, you know, tell the operator that buys it how, how they can operate the machine or not. So like Michael said, if they buy a college kid buys it and puts it on a, on a shelf somewhere in a bar, you know, they There's have also a lot of lawyers with varying opinions as yeah. to the exactly what all these laws mean, and they do vary by state. And that's what yeah. my point about the small operator versus a larger operator is. And again, we're not a manufacturer like you. We're more of an operator. But yeah, the, state, the state, point state, is that we don't have to um, we have to set the bar higher or else we have to have 50 small uh, details on every machine we're working on. Right. In the and chat, what, there's what, like what, uh, two or yeah. three people there that are saying that there's local ATMs around them that that do no KYC in Canada, well, in Canada, of, but it's it's a um, coin it's radar a, ATM. You know, coin radar ATM has all of the or or anyone yeah, that's, that's Vlad's site. He's up to like fifteen thousand ATMs on there now, and everybody yeah, that's well, looking for an ATM uses it. All this kind of crap. So yeah, yeah it's, you, the, you uh, can get an, it's an app on your phone. You know, you let me pitch you guys. Now. I got an idea. I've been thinking about this. For, for at least 10 minutes. Sorry, Bitcoin's <laughs> down. I can't afford it right now. We got three ATM people here, right? So I was inspired recently by listening to- I actually um, have two personalities as well, so it could be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to a, a Paxful. Paxful, they were talking about the crazy like high amount of peer-to-peer -peer trading that happens in, in those markets in Africa and in India and stuff. And, um, you know, there's like- it, it the, the the gray market for over the counter trading or whatever is just a cultural thing over there. It's it's like, you know, you can't even own a certain like more than a hundred dollars worth of dollars. You can't use more than more than a hundred dollars a hundred dollars worth of USD over there. So it's just like they go to the edges. So I was thinking like, well, how can we, you know, spur that along in North America using ATM networks so that it's peer to peer through an ATM. Like, is there a way to kind of merge local yeah. Pesa, this? M Pesa. So, the so problem is logic. that, we, go ahead, go ahead, a, Doug. Well, we've had, you know, this vision of an ATM that was a bankless ATM, you know, where the biggest pain points for ATM operators is cash. So, you know, we have an ATM that actually pulls cash in through crypto and then on a legal separate other side of the same machine is a way to um, dispense uh, ATM money through bank ATMs. Now, internally, there's a legal separate lock that those two funds don't intermingle at all. 
but that's one of the possibilities where we help people in you know uh, you know the other six million the other six billion people to join a network because they don't have bank accounts but they may want to and there's even possibility. This is what I was going to say is like in Africa, a lot of these people are using M-Pesa and you're asking, yeah. why don't we put a bunch of machines down there? Because Bitcoin ATM machines are very expensive and they're very culpable to uh, theft and such. And mm -hmm. the average transaction. I'm saying, in, I'm saying uh, like bring that here. Like there's a ton of volume. People don't care about regulations in Africa. There's a vibrant community. We of can't privacy. bring that here. Talk to your local government and tell them to let the Bitcoin ATM companies bring that here. We do a cashless machine. Uh, we have a cash list that, that's 500 bucks, literally, that you just sit on a counter, you drill it into the counter, and that's it. And, and it works wonderfully. Does that go through like the, the does that go through the clerks of the stores then or something right. like that? Yeah, yeah, it goes through our own banking system that we have internally, mm -hmm. and then we get we every month they get a check. Mm -hmm. they but how does uh, cash get from the store to the bank? Because like we've had deals with stores before where they've tried to deposit our cash and even with compliance working on it, it was still a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're, our, the one we have is cat. We have a cash in cash out. We have a card in card out uh, that actually puts a, a, a debit card in someone's hand. And then we have a, a countertop unit that's cashless. You can use your debit card, credit card or whatever to buy so what you're saying to answer Brad's question is you'd send these cheap $500 units down there and somebody in Europe or US or whatever would be able to put money in and then somewhere down in Africa, they'd be able to take it out yeah. so that we wouldn't have to have a huge machine full of cash and they get it on a card or it just ties into M-Pesa, which is what everybody's using down there already because uh, they trust the cell phone networks more than the banks. Like, can we use the network of people that are like in, in Muslim culture, there's the Hawala trust network that, that people just like naturally have this trust, right? So can we tap into these cultural networks of peer to peer, non KYC private, like trust networks no. and use No, it that's here? the problem. It depends uh, because then you, then you expose yourself to these legal risks and there's a lot of uncertainty. So, I mean, I don't know if uh, actually I do know, I do know in the United States, I could not take a hundred dollars and send it to someone in Africa that my customer uh, does not know who are, and that I do not know who are. And I don't about, think I could legally do it. I what think about if you're would. not taking custody during the trade, what if it's more like a, like a well, technically, we never take custody in the trade on our ATMs. You agree that you're only sending money to yourself. So technically, it's not even a third party transfer. But the second we started transferring from a U.S. machine to an African something, we'd have issues. But my question is this. Why wouldn't people that wanted to send twenty dollars to uh, Nigeria or whatever or whatever in Africa, they're trying to do it. Why wouldn't they just go to the machine, buy twenty dollars worth of Bitcoin? And then buy with that. So right now, everybody in Africa is using this M-Pesa system, which is basically your cell phone credit. You send transactions via SMS. So essentially, they're trusting the telephone operators more than they are the government-sponsored uh, banks. But that's a whole different discussion. But uh, why would we want to send them a bank transfer or have a $10,000 machine when they already have this super efficient SMS network? So I think people would just buy a Bitcoin from us, from the ATM. We'd know who they are. That's all we need. Then they can turn around and send that to their family and their relatives or whoever for food or whatever they need to do. Peter Todd. Oh, my God. Oh, Trouble right, has officially man. arrived. Oh, Trouble is here. Howdy. To be a little more tech, uh, even though uh, Joshua from Voltura is going to join us as well, so we can get back to the uh discussion of transactions well hey, uh, Peter, how are man, all of you like not eating and like just sort of like are you disappearing for a while eating and then coming back what's what's going on i'm just oh, holding no, all my bcash as long as i can i've only been drinking tequila i have not <laughs> I know, we I'm, and, uh, uh yeah so i'm still uh well no it's well, like 5 p.m 5 30 p.m where tea. you are just it's like midnight for the, here for the Arnold brothers. Uh, I, put the, I put the link to my book in the, um, in the chat. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So there it is. And then it's for the Arnold brothers. You can look it up and there's a couple of snippets on steam it of all places. Oh, God. It has a couple of my, uh, all right. Hey guys, I want to, I, I want to bring this back to tech. Uh, Peter, we were like talking a lot of shit about quantum computers, uh, 
any comments you want to add to the ridiculousness of the quantum computers being a threat? And, and a lot of this talk is coming from shit coiners that have, you know, like saying that their coins are quantum resistant. Uh, Peter Floor is yours, Bitcoin's birthday. Um, I think you were, you were around like before Bitcoin even existed, uh, trying to build this shit. So uh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, so actually prior to Bitcoin, um, well, you know, being involved in kind of publicly, uh, I actually worked at a company doing, you know, some of the same technology as like what goes in quantum computers. Um, I was actually designing, uh, yeah, as one of my projects, designing a squid controller, um, which is sort of a superconducting quantum interference. Anyone else getting like need a very it was really funny at that computer. job? Uh, Peter, it's not working, buddy. Peter, you got to upgrade you're, your you're internet, you're man. Uh, turn turn off a minor or two. Turn off the quantum minor in the background so that we can do the show here. Uh, 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 or, many or your torrents, uh, you know, uh, server uh, uh, or something like that. I've got this running like off uh, a cell phone connection, which was working fine like an hour ago for another Zoom call. So I don't know what's going on with you guys. I don't know, uh, but you're, you, you were like, I couldn't understand what you were saying because it, it was like, yeah. seriously. I don't think it was that bad. Let's give him another nobody one can, Nobody can understand you, man. We just don't get what you're saying. You're just crazy. <laughs> That's really it. <laughs> All right, look, guys, let, let, let's give Peter one more shot. I, I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, well, I uh, saying so. I, I worked, um, you know, in a company kind of doing the same kind of technology um, with, you know, superconducting, quantum, et cetera, et cetera. And it was very funny how, I could talk to the physicists there about quantum computing. And what they basically said is they kind of laughed and figured, well, you know, what we've seen is that the amount of money it takes to get a quantum computer faster goes up exponentially as you make the quantum computer more capable. So it's the exact same scaling problem as, you know, breaking crypto in general. I mean, the more bits, the cost to, you know, get a conventional computer goes up exponentially but it's just done in a different way where the computer itself gets exponentially more expensive. So I'm not going to say it's impossible, but the, the very idea that quantum computers can break crypto period, there's a good chance it will never happen. You know, the, the physics, the, no one has proven that the physics is actually possible. And secondly, even if they do, I mean, you can just go and swap in a new signature algorithm and you know, there goes your quantum computers being able to break anything. I mean, it's, you know, there's some question about lost coins, but let's face it. Like if this doesn't happen overnight, the economy will probably not really mind yet another way of mining by stealing lost coins. Plus there's options like, you know, confiscating them and making them possible to spend, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's, it's, it's just not, uh, it's not a threat that threatens Bitcoin any more than other things on the internet. I think there's so many things that are a much more immediate threat right now than uh, quantum computing. It's the last thing yeah. we need to worry about. Yeah. I think Jimmy's crying over here. Your, your explanation was so good. <laughs> any, any I, I, I'm just getting tired right now, man. Uh, this, this, we've been on this street for like, uh, I don't know, six, seven hours. It's I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm like, you know, I'm, I, I might need I'm a little bit of a break. I, might, I, might I just bought some Bitcoin. Yeah, I met up with I met up with Erica like before eight a.m. to get this thing rolling, and it's now uh, five thirty p.m. where we are. So it's uh, I'm still good. Like this is. Uh, what happens when you don't eat? Yeah, you, well, that that happens when you have a lot it's, of. It's midnight here. Do you want me to order you a, a pizza or something? Uh, can, <laughs> I, can, I can hook you up. I'm pretty sure it won't even cost ten thousand bitcoins, and I could get one there to you. Well, I, I I just need to go downstairs and eat something. I've yeah, I, I've, I've just been here. Get some so. food. Come on back. We'll still be here. Any other questions for Peter Todd, guys? It's a rarity to have him on a stream. Uh, also, Josh from Volturo. Uh, how's where the, where hey, are you, Peter? Are you in Canada anywhere? right now? Yep. Okay, so you're in the socialist. Uh, um, Dude, are the Canadians yeah. and uh, and the C Canadians and Californians on this program right now? It's uh... <laughs> well, <Yeah>, kind of. <laughs> at least where I specifically am, all this lockdown bullshit. It's there, but it's you know, it's not as bad as say if I was in Italy. You know, it could mm. be a fair bit worse, or, or for that matter, San Francisco or Australia. Mm. Well, Australia is weird because it's kind of a mix of, yes, a bunch of bullshit, but because, you know, they just got lucky and they're in the right season, they don't currently have that much lockdown, 
But then again, I, I think every Steph, time th- Stefan Levera was on earlier, he he basically made it sound pretty bad, especially well, with respect to international travel. Hey, hey, I got yeah, it, it's it, it's mixed. It depends on exactly where you are. Hey guys, we do have a good question, and it's uh, something that like it's obvious, but it needed someone in the live chat. So Peter. Uh, how do you differentiate between lost coins and coins that people have, were too lazy to resecure once the quantum computer, uh, if the quantum computer uh, is able to decrypt old passwords? Like, like this could be bad. So can you just elaborate we're on really that? really in trouble you with can't. Satoshi coins, right? I, I mean, the simple answer is you can't. Like, we don't, e- we don't even know if the Satoshi coins are Satoshi. You know, it's... Bitcoin right. so does not any have random, any random guy that we don't know could have the keys to those coins right now. That is like 10% of our entire market after you account for lost coins. Uh, uh, well, I mean, again, that like, that's what, that's why I said earlier, uh, depending on how fast this happens, chances are like, look this way. What is the total volume of the markets compared to that 10%? If it happens over a sufficiently long period of time, you know, essentially that they get stolen. Because it doesn't really matter. Coins each wallet or whatever. So what you're saying is they wouldn't be able to crack all of them at once. It would. They wouldn't have yeah, a million coins yeah, tomorrow. They'd yeah. Have. It's well. As an example, I mean, it's not really clear that they'll be able to scale up quantum computing because of this incredible expense. So we may not actually have a world where there is enough quantum computing power out there to actually go and apply to this problem quickly. And secondly, again, I mean, the simple reality is if this becomes a problem, people will probably go have a soft fork and the rate at which those coins can be spent will be changed, potentially to zero. I mean, one option is just have a soft fork. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can go spend your coins. But it's but you know the rate at which these coins are allowed to be spent, period, is then slowed down to some level. And if people want to get their money out, well, they can eventually. If people want to steal some other person's money, they can also do that eventually. You know, there's a whole bunch of options there. And the important thing is that the ability to fix this problem for f- coins going forward exists. That's right. not true for things work. like so Zcash. E- so even if the, say, the government were able to develop a quantum computer and be able to hack uh, some of these coins, we could make a soft fork and fix it. It wouldn't be complete yeah. end of Bitcoin. Yeah. The, the key difference is there are some coins, and I, you know, I think currently Zcash falls in this category, where the underlying math, they do not know how to make it quantum resistant. So if quant- you know, fully capable quantum computers exist, Zcash is just screwed and their, you know, their claim to fame disappears. Now, will that be true in 10 years? I don't know, but you know, it, it's a risk for certain types of coins. And it's one of the advantages of doing things very simply like Bitcoin does. Whereas I like to say uh, a drunk fine arts student could go and uh, implement it. <laughs> which, part, which part of Zcash? Is it the, the privacy part or what, what part? Of yeah, the, the, the ZK proofs. Um, yeah. My, my understanding is the current... Uh, iteration of ZK proofs, nobody has a good idea of how to make that quantum hard. You know what's interesting right. too? JP Morgan's coin use, uses ZK SARFs. Yep. Um, that's just so interesting to me. Why do they need that for their interbank settlement? Oh, it's for branding. It's always for branding <laughs> or, or for marketing or something like that. that no, that's I mean, almost always the, the, the banks that I The banks that I've talked to at high levels have said the reason why we haven't got into crypto yet because it's not private enough. That yep. seems to be a fairly high level normal. That seems like a giant contradiction to how uh, crypto is perceived. That the yeah. reason why banks aren't getting in is because it's too private. Well, <laughs> privacy for me, but not for thee. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's only as private as you want it to be, even with like uh, Monero and such. If I was working with a bank and I wanted them to know which transaction was going to who, I could easily uh, identify it. Yeah if that was their requirement. And don't don't forget with uh, things like GDPR, banks really do have significant privacy um, responsibilities under certain circumstances. So if you have technology that by default is very, very private, you can then implement the revealing of data when necessary. And, you know, I mean, I've talked to a lot of banks, you know, doing consulting, and this actually is a very common thing for them to say, ironically, because, you know, uh, for sure, I mean, they want to be able to pick and choose who they comply with. You know, why comply with someone who you're not legally obliged to? Hey, so going back to the privacy question, news just broke the other day that well, at least one of the exchanges is looking to remove uh, privacy coins off of the exchange. What are your general thoughts on that? 
I mean, I'm not all that surprised, but, uh, you know, I, I would see that as just a risk reduction for them, make their life easier. It goes you know, back I, to your earlier answer where you said, though, that you can disclose, uh, you can remove the privacy. So if an exchange, say Kraken, that's operating in the U.S., needs to be able to sell Monero to customers, they can just require that they somehow taint those coins or something so that it has the customer's identification on them and they're no longer anonymous. So I think they could fix it that way. They certainly could, but it's more work than just delisting it. I mean, I, I, I suspect what, about what that the really says. All that stuff, though? Yeah, but I guess what I'm saying is I, I suspect what that really says is they're just not making enough money on it for it to really, really be worth the headache. How easy is it to list things now, though? Because like you have this XRP thing where people are delisting uh, stuff from the from major exchanges. And some of these people have margin trading and futures and options and all sorts of stuff going on. How can you just now go and delist something? Because it's smaller than Bitcoin by an order of magnitude. <laughs> like, <laughs> is, is XRP smaller than Bitcoin? I thought that according to their uh, created market cap that they actually had like a billion coins worth uh, – well, I guess it's still less than Bitcoin well, now. Well, what matters for an exchange is volume. You know, that's, that's your serious answer. And if the volume isn't that big, then, you know, you're just not going to get the revenue necessary to take on these kinds of risks. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible. I just trying to point out, like, if you, if you actually looked at the financials, I would not be surprised. It's just not worth the trouble to take on this kind of risk for something when there's plenty of other coins to go and trade in. You know, not to mention, I mean, Bitcoin exists. That's what we find with the ATMs is 99% of people want yep. Bitcoin. Only 1% of people want other coins. When we offer other coins, people accidentally buy them and stuff. And then we have to do manual uh, reversals and everything to correct all the compliance. And it's a nightmare. So we only offer Bitcoin on the ATMs. I mean, it's the, uh, it is 99% of the big market, right? Yep. Yeah, Mike. And that, and that makes sense. And also like that 1% of the shit coiners, uh, they're also like screaming the loudest to like get it listed there because it gives them legitimacy. Uh, so you're not helping your own position by doing so. But uh, Peter, I want to get back to, since you are the, uh, the technical guy on the show now. Uh, and um, yes, we are looking at it, that exchanges are delisting, delisting these privacy coins like Zcash and Monero uh, due to regulatory concerns. Uh, but should they also be concerned about the technological concerns? Because one of the knocks on these privacy coins is in order to make them private, uh, there is a lot of obscurity as to what's actually going on. And could it be dangerous for an exchange or an ATM, for example, to, uh, from a technological perspective, to keep supporting these privacy coins? I mean, there's no getting around it. Like the moment you have the kinds of privacy Monero and Zcash offer, um, you know, and I don't mean things like Dash, which aren't actually different than Bitcoin, but, you know, true privacy things like Monero and Zcash, because the math obscures what's actually happening, if something goes wrong, it's just that much harder to go fix. You know, that, that's just a fundamental trade-off. And, you know, with Bitcoin, we've had, what is it now, I think, one inflation bug that's actually been exploited, and there was potentially, I think, a second one, if I remember correctly, um, no, not to mention the, the third one of how the subsidy in theory uh, went on forever due to an overflow. But yeah, that, that's kind of always an April Fool's joke. But the, the issue, you know, the difference there is when Bitcoin doesn't work, where money went to and, you know, where money came from, where money went to, that's not obscured by encryption. It's, it's very clear at a technical level. It's not clear what human beings should have had had what money, but at a technical level, it's very clear, you know, what the numbers are. And that means if something goes wrong, it's a lot easier to go fix it because you can easily diagnose it and you can easily, you know, roll things back, et cetera, et cetera. And, well, and also I should say, it's easy to even detect it in the first place. With Zcash, you know, when they had their inflation bug, it's still an open question if it's ever been exploited. You know, like if- Oh crap. Uh, I mean, what worries me is I, th I feel it's like the other way around eventually that that exchanges and ATMs will have to deal with uh, with privacy coins more than non-privacy coins because to be the police and the judge of every transaction that comes through you and see what where it came from, when it it's came impossible. from, and and the types uh, uh, and the price that that puts on the 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 uh, well the business. Um, is far too much. So I, 
you know, I think eventually it'll come to the point where, well, I don't know, will we'll governments make you delist Bitcoin because Lightning Network's a little bit more private? Hey, hey Josh, I, can I just counter that real quick? Because I recently had this argument with someone. At least you'll have a business. Like, so if your view is, well, I don't want to deal with Bitcoin and I'd rather deal with privacy coins because then I don't have to deal with regulation, you won't have a business because they'll just take you down with that. Oh, I think, I think we're the exact opposite. Uh, I think that we'd rather not deal with these anonymous coins and stuff that are 1% of our market share because legitimate people could actually just fill out the KYC and be part of it. And who is really the people that are trying to hide everything? Is that really people that are for their privacy and such, or is it criminals? And at some point, if you're operating a money services business, you've got to make this determination. Yeah, go get Monero. Uh, all right, Peter, uh, finish your train of thought because you got frozen on us there for a minute. Yeah, I, I do not know what's with this uh, internet connection. It only doesn't work on your show, so I'll guess government <laughs> conspiracy. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I was just trying to say, like, the, the fact is, because these numbers aren't there, when things go wrong, it's just that much harder to fix. You know, Zcash could still have undetected inflation from their last inflation bug. Not to mention, you know, a new inflation bug, too. You know, it's just... Oh, God damn it. And back hey, to Josh. Tone, hey, Tone, Tone, I'm going to take this quick uh, Peter break here to let you know that I'm going to hop off. Thank you so much for inviting me, man. This was awesome. Hey, Tone, you got me or no? Oh, what's funny? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tone, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop off. Thanks, everyone. It was really nice meeting you. Yeah, it was nice to meet you, bro. Later, guys. Michael, I see you again. Later.